Listen carefully and answer questions one to three. Hello? Ralph, it's Paula. Hi. You know I told you we could apply to the local council for money for our drama club. I've got the application form here, but we need to get it back to them by the end of the week. I could send it on to you. You really ought to fill it in as president of the club, but I don't know if it'll get to you in time. Well, you're the secretary, so I expect it's OK if you fill it in. Yeah, but I'd really like to check it together. Right, that's fine. Like, the first part asks for the main contact person. Can I put you there? Sure. Right, so that's Ralph Pearson. Oh, and then I need your contact address. So that's 203 South Road, isn't it? No, 230. Oh, sorry, I always get that wrong. <laughs> then it's Drayton. Oh, do you think they need a postcode? Better put it. It's DR6 8AB. Mm -hmm, OK. Telephone number. That's 01453 586 098, isn't it? Yes. Right. Now, in the next part of the form, I have to give information about our group. So, name of group. That's easy. We're the Community Youth Theatre Group. But then I have to describe it. So, what sort of information do you think they want? Well, they need to know we're amateurs, not professional actors. And how many members we've got. What's that at present? 20? 18. And should we put in the age range that's 13 to 22? No, I don't think we need to. But we'd better put a bit about what we actually do. Something like members take part in drama activities. Activities and workshops? OK. Right. That's all for that section, I think. Now listen and answer questions 4 to 10. Now, the next bit is about the project itself, what we're applying for funding for. So, first of all, they need to know how much money we want. The maximum's £500. I think we agreed we'd ask for 250 didn't we? OK. There's no point in asking for too much. We'll have less chance of getting it. Then we need to say what the project, um, the activity is. Right. So, we could write something like, to produce a short play for young children. Should we say it's interactive? Yes, good idea. Right, I've got that. Then we have to say what we actually need the money for. Isn't that it? No, we have to give a breakdown of details, I think. Well, there's the scenery. But we're making that. We need to buy the materials, though. Oh, OK. Then there's the costumes. Right. That's going to be at least £50. OK. And what else? Oh... I just found out we have to have insurance. I don't think it'll cost much, but we need to get it organised. Yes, I'd forgotten about that. And we could be breaking the law if we don't have it. Good thing we've already got curtains in the hall. At least we don't have to worry about that. Hmm. We'll need some money for publicity. Otherwise, no one will know what we're doing. And then a bit of money for unexpected things that come up. Just put sundries at the end of the list. OK, fine. Now, the next thing they want to know is, if they give us the grant, how they'll be credited. What do they mean, credited? I think they mean how we'll let the public know that they funded us. They want people to know they've supported us. It looks good for them. Hmm. Well, we could say we'd announce it at the end of the play. We could make a speech or something. Uh, they might prefer to see something in writing. We'll be giving the audience a programme, won't we? So we could put an acknowledgement in that? Yeah, that's a better idea. OK. And the last thing they want to know is if we've approached any other organisations for funding and what the outcome was. Well, only National Youth Services. And they said that at present funds were not available for arts projects. Right. I'll put that. 
And then I think that's it. I'll get that in the post straight away. I really hope we get the money. I think we've got a pretty good chance. Hope so, anyway. Thanks for doing all this, Paula. That's OK. See you soon. Bye. Bye. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Hi, I'm Steve Pinfold, and I'm here today to tell you about my gap year, which I took about 20 years ago. Unlike many students these days who go travelling or get some work experience between school and university, I decided to do something completely different after finishing my degree. I applied to work for a charity organisation. What it does is it sends people with particular skills to countries where those skills are needed. Apart from having some experience teaching English to summer school students, I didn't have any particularly useful skills, I thought, but luckily I was still accepted. I had to find the money for the flight, but you get free accommodation. I stayed with a family of five. And you do get paid, but not much. It's a bit like pocket money, enough to get by. I worked in an orphanage and taught English at a local school. Where was I? Well, originally, I was going to be sent to a village in India, but at the last minute, the organisation decided to send me to Trinidad. Now, this is a fascinating place. It's an island in the Caribbean. Well, in fact, the country is actually two islands. The smaller one is called Tobago, which is connected somehow to the word tobacco. Anyway, there I was, a young white guy living and working on an island which is mostly a mixture of descendants from Africa and India. The Africans were originally brought over as slaves, and the Indians came later as indentured workers. That means they agreed to come for a specific time, but many of them stayed. There are also some Trinidadians of Chinese and British origin, though the native inhabitants were basically wiped out by colonialization. I myself felt completely accepted and had the time of my life. The language everyone speaks is English, so there was no problem for me there, but some concepts don't quite translate. They're pure Trinidadian. There's the term liming, for example, which means sitting around watching the world go by. Also, there's the famous carnival, when the whole island is taken up in playing mass. For a whole month, around February or March, it depends when Easter is, everyone's busy preparing costumes, practicing calypsos, soca and steel pan music, and most importantly, partying. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. When the actual official carnival starts, it's days of 24-hour dancing in the streets. In Trinidad, it's called whining. You've probably seen this sort of thing on TV, in the more famous carnival in Rio, or even at the Notting Hill Carnival in London. Many people join bands, each one of which has a theme. For example the sea or jungle fever, and they have costumes designed and made to go with the theme. These can cost a thousand dollars for the king and queen of each band. They're incredible. The whole city is a non-stop party zone full of colour and sound. It's serious too. The bands are in competition and the winner gets a million dollars. Sorry, I got a bit carried away with those memories. Back to my real job there. The orphanage was called St. Augustine's, and that's also the name of the place where it was, St. Augustine, a town just outside the capital city, Port of Spain. I didn't have any particular job description, just to be with the children and tell stories, sing songs and play games. Oh, and we also went camping in the jungle once. <laughs> I could tell you a few stories about that particular escapade. Every time I arrived at the gate, kids would come running towards me, shouting, with big smiles on their faces. 
The younger children seemed fascinated by my blonde hair and loved to touch it as if it was something miraculous. The English teaching I did two days a week in a primary school for six to eleven-year-olds. The kids may have been poor, but they all wore neat and clean uniforms and were so respectful and enthusiastic. I've now been teaching for many years in different countries, and I still think those were the best students I've ever taught. What else did I do while I was there? I swam a lot. Can you imagine what it's like swimming with dolphins? and with pelicans diving into the sea right next to you. More seriously, I trained to be a Samaritan. That's someone who listens and supports people who have problems with their lives. Overall, what I took from the experience was a sense of being in another culture, or rather cultures. As humans, we all share many characteristics, but we express ourselves in various ways. In Trinidad, there are lots of different communities and religions and so many different kinds of festival to see. Hindu, Muslim, Christian, as well as some rather mysterious African traditions. There are quite a few Rastafarians, too. Trinidad is, as Americans are fond of saying of their own country, a melting pot where everybody is greeted warmly. Go and see for yourself. I'm not sure how it's changed since I was there, but I'd love to find out. As you listen, answer the questions. Good morning, everyone. Today, I'll talk about unusual ocean spills that have occurred in the world's oceans. In November of 1992, people at beaches in Canada and Alaska noticed something strange. Blue turtles, red beavers, green frogs and yellow ducks came bobbing toward them. They soon found out where the strange creatures were coming from. A ship from Hong Kong was on its way to Tacoma, Washington, when it was hit by a severe storm in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. During the storm, huge waves washed 12 containers overboard. Inside the containers were 29,000 plastic bath toys. One of the containers opened, and thousands of plastic bath toys spilled out and began to float across the Pacific Ocean. Ten months later, the first yellow ducks arrived on the North American shore. Beachcombers along the shore began to find the toys and reported them to local newspapers. But the people who were most excited by the plastic toys were the oceanographers. It gave them an opportunity to study ocean currents and winds. Now listen to the second part of the discussion. Oceanographers drop bottles into the ocean to study these things. But it would be too expensive to drop 29,000 bottles into the ocean at once. Imagine the value of studying the plastic ducks and frogs. This gave some interesting information to the oceanographers. The first toys were picked up in Sitka, Alaska, ten months after they were washed off the ship. Some headed back into the North Pacific, while others drifted around the Arctic Ocean and headed for the North Atlantic. Many of the toys were swept northeast by the wind and were frozen in the ice of the Bering Sea. They're expected to cross the North Pole and float on down to the British Isles. This reminds me of another unusual ocean spill. In 1990, a ship travelling to the west coast of the United States from Korea was caught in a severe storm. The waves swept 21 containers of Nike shoes into the water. Scientists estimate that about 80,000 running, jogging and hiking shoes, 40,000 pairs of shoes, to you and me, hit the water at once. The shoes were for men, women and children. About six months later, People at beaches from Oregon to British Columbia began to find running shoes washed ashore. 
By the end of the year, Washington newspapers reported people finding hundreds of shoes. In Seattle, thousands of shoes floated to shore. Since the shoes were not attached, they arrived one at a time. The shoes were dirty, but after they were washed, they were still in good condition. People set up exchanges to find matches for their shoes. Oceanographers studied the information to learn more about the ocean. Some Nike shoes reached Hawaii. Others went to the Philippines and Japan. According to the scientists, some of the shoes are on a trip around the world and should end up back in Washington and Oregon. Can you believe it? Many pairs of running shoes, as well as plastic ducks and frogs, are still on their ocean journey. So if you go to a beach anywhere in the world, don't be surprised if you see a green plastic frog or a woman's size seven jogging shoe bobbing toward you. So keep your eyes out, so you may find free bath toys and even a new pair of shoes. Thank you for attending my lecture. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Hi, I'm Emma Bailey, and today I'm going to be talking baby talk. Hopefully, you'll find the subject interesting rather than infantile. I'd like to start by getting you to imagine a scenario: you're in an office or at a family gathering when a mother comes in with her young baby. Like everyone else, you want to see the mother and baby, and you probably want to talk to the baby. How do you do this? What kind of language do you use? Recent research has shown that adults all talk to babies in similar ways. They repeat phrases over and over again in a high-pitched sing-song voice with long vowel sounds, and if they ask questions, they exaggerate their intonation. Researchers have discovered that this kind of language, which they have called motherese, is used by adults all over the world when they talk to babies. And according to a new theory, motherese forms a kind of framework for the development of language in children. This baby talk, so the theory goes, itself originated as a response to another aspect of human evolution: walking upright. In contrast to other primates. Humans give birth to babies that are relatively undeveloped. So, whereas a baby chimpanzee can hold on to its four-legged mother and ride along on her back shortly after birth, helpless human babies have to be held and carried everywhere by their upright mothers. Having to hold on to an infant constantly would have made it more difficult for the mother to gather food. In this situation, researchers suggest. Human mothers began putting their babies down beside them while gathering food, to pacify an infant distressed by this separation. The mother would talk to her offspring and continue her search for food. This remote communication system could have marked the start of motherese, as mothers increasingly relied on their voices to control the emotions of their babies and later the actions of their mobile juveniles. Words emerged from the jumble of sounds, and became conventionalized across human communities, ultimately producing language. Not all anthropologists, however, accept the assumption that early human mothers put their children down when they were looking for food. They point out that even modern parents do not do this. Instead. They prefer to hold their babies in their arms or carry them around in slings. They suggest that early mothers probably made slings of some kind, both for ease of transportation and to keep their babies warm by holding them close to their bodies. If this was the case, they would not have needed to develop a way of comforting or controlling their babies from a distance. It's not only anthropologists but also linguists who challenge this explanation for how language developed. They say that although the motherese theory may account for the development of speech, it does not explain the development of grammar. Nor they say does it explain how the sounds that mothers made acquired their meaning. 
most experts believe that language is a relatively modern invention that appeared in the last 100,000 years or so. But if the latest theory is right, baby talk, and perhaps fully evolved language, was spoken much earlier than that. We know that humans were walking upright one and a half million years ago. This means that mothers may have been putting their babies down at this time and communicating with them in mother ease. We can be sure that this is not the end of the story, as anthropologists and linguists will continue to investigate the origins of this most human of abilities, language.